Hello everyone, well, welcome to the seminar. I'm Dimitna Callahan from Syracuse University and it's my great good fortune to be a colleague of Amanda Eubanks-Winkler whose um, book we're going, new book we're going to be uh, discussing today. Um, her first book was about Shakespeare and music, Oh, Let Us Howl Some Heavy Note, Music for the Witches, the Melancholic and the Mad in 17th century English stage. She's also uh, written Beyond Boundaries, Rethinking Music Circulation in Early Modern England, uh, which was edited with Linda Austin and Candace Bailey. And um, she has uh, written uh, uh, a couple of other um, co-authored co pieces, including Shakespeare in the Theatre, Sir William Davenant and the Duke's Company, and Performing Shakespeare. Um, she's also uh, edited um, music manuscripts and done many, many other things that would take, it would be uh, belabor the matter to speak of. But today we're going to talk about her wonderful new book, Music, Dance and Drama in Early Modern English Schools. And she's particularly well qualified to talk about this because she's also worked a great deal as a dramaturge in, in numerous locations, but most recently, and I think most prominently, um, at the Globe Theatre on The Tempest, on rest, the restoration productions of The Tempest, and at the, um, at the Folger Theatre, uh, on, on Macbeth. So she really has the practical experience as well. So without further ado, uh, ado um, welcome Amanda and uh, we want to hear more about this wonderful new book. Thanks so much, Dimna. I'm really happy to be here today and thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I'm gonna start off by just giving a brief uh, talk which draws on some of the material from the book just in order to, to give you kind of a taster, I suppose. Um, and then of course we'll move into questions if any of you have questions about this work. So let me just share my screen. And hopefully you, you are able to see that. Just Dimna, give me a thumbs up if you can. <laughs> yeah, great, okay. All right, so. A few years ago, I saw my daughter perform in her school musical, Singing in the Rain. I performed in many such shows in my youth, and watching her, I vividly remembered my own experiences singing, dancing, and acting in roles that were meant for adults, performances that sometimes went well. I'm quite proud of my Mabel in Pirates, <laughs> and sometimes went very poorly. I was really bad as Fantine. My daughter's school performance was memorable for a different set of reasons. Obviously, I did not assess these children in the same way as I would adult performers or the way I judged myself in my youth. Instead, I viewed the children singing and dancing and acting through the rosy lens of parental devotion, even when an over-exuberant Don almost tap danced off the stage. Watching my daughter sing and dance that evening brought my personal and intellectual lives together. I have a long-standing academic interest in children's performance, for I have written extensively about Henry Purcell's opera, Dido and Aeneas, performed by girls at Josiah's Priest Boarding School in Chelsea around 1688. I could not help but wonder if the performance I witnessed in upstate New York hinted at the chaotic and charming energy of the girls at Priest School. Indeed, like many performance studies scholars, I would posit that such an inquiry is not an idle one, for the performed past doesn't entirely disappear. When children act a scene from a script, realize a choreography, or sing from a score, they serve as conduits between past and present. For these sources, these documents of performance, to use Tiffany Sturm's term, tell the bodies what to do, what sounds to make, revivifying and recap recapitulating what others have done before. From a more traditional historical perspective, I'd always suspected that Dido and Aeneas was part of a much larger tradition of pedagogical performance, a suspicion shared by many of my musicology colleagues. Conversations with them persuaded me that the topic required further investigation, so off to the archives I went in search of evidence. Finding this evidence proved to be a difficult task, for as I collected materials for my study, I kept finding gaps that pointed toward the things I might never know. Missing musical notation, absent choreographies, the embodied physicality of performing children from centuries past. 
To fill in these gaps, I broadened the scope of my archive. Naturally, the operas, masks, and musical plays performed at early modern schools are key to our understanding of the role of performance in pedagogy, but so are descriptions of school performances in letters and documents written by pupils' family members, school records from local and national archives that mention performance activities, and advertisements regarding performance-based curricula. I also collected printed and manuscript music connected with personnel who worked at schools for musical theatrical performances before an audience were only the most public manifestation of a larger pedagogical practice. I even analyzed plays performed on the London stage that feature scenes with school-based singing, dancing, and acting to understand the place pedagogical performance occupied in the cultural imagination. I also thought in terms of performance to fill in the gaps. When we only consider what is on the page, we risk erasing the actual bodies and voices of the early modern children who performed, causing us to misunderstand and misinterpret the past. I animated these sources by analyzing the implications of performance, collecting information about how early modern children and their teachers sang, danced, and acted. I also considered how these interactions might have disrupted or altered meaning. What if a boy's voice cracked? What if a student's voice teacher played her lover? What if a young person took a role, a witch, a siren, that undermined notions of appropriate gendered behavior? A brief overview of the content of my book might be useful at this point. Pedagogical performance was an activity, something children did, and so I organized my study around a series of performance-based questions. Chapter one defines the parameters of the study, delineating the purposes of various educational institutions in post-Reformation England, the grammar school, the charity school, the academy, and the boarding school and the conflicted role music and dance played in English life and educational schema more generally. The chapters that follow explore how the schoolroom interacted with other performance spaces, the church, the court, the domicile, the concert room, the public theater, and performed identities, religious, gendered, classed. Each of these chapters opens with a reaction to a specific event of a specific element, rather, of children's performance as recorded in a diary entry, mandates in grammar school statutes, a doting letter from a relative, before moving to a consideration of the archival remains of performance and the ways in which these documents might have been animated by early modern school children. My study concludes with an analysis of a recent performance of Dido and Aeneas that engages directly with the specter of the school at Chelsea. Deborah Warner and William Christie's production from 2008 at the Opera Comique in Paris, where unruly schoolgirls interjected themselves into the action, running, dancing imperfectly, making noise, their unpredictable behavior providing a fleshly connection to the performative past. In the time that remains today, I'm going to discuss two case studies from my book, a taster, if you will. My talk today focuses on interesting archival finds rather than a well-known canonical work like Dido and Aeneas or the other famous opera performed by schoolgirls, John Blow's Venus and Adonis, although I'm happy to answer questions about those in the Q&A if you're interested. The first case study is drawn from chapter five of my book, Performing Vice. This chapter focuses on the permeable boundary between role and actor and early modern anxieties that children might be infected by the character they played. Boys were taught rhetoric and oratory as part of their grammar school curriculum and effective oration requires the student to actually feel the passion himself in order to move his audience's affections. What if those passions were vice-filled involving crime, illicit sex, murder, and other milder forms of misbehavior. This chapter considers how the performance of vice haunted the early modern child, how early modern notions of boyhood or girlhood inflected and shaped the act of performance, and the possible reasons for casting children as rule breakers, sexual deviants, and seducers in a pedagogical context. 
Most of the performance activities discussed in my book sought to inculcate good behavior in children, performing sacred music to instill Protestant values, teaching them to emulate courtly, courtly behavior, playing and singing music and learning dances designed to foster accomplishment. There were sometimes gaps between intention and execution. The messiness of embodied performance might thwart pedagogical aims. The tensions between didactic aims and performative realities are even more acute in early modern musical plays and masks that required boys to behave in a subversive way, ways that challenged expected, expected masculine norms, ways that undermined expectations regarding obedience and conformity. As some of you probably know, this tension has been investigated with regards to the children's companies in late 16th and early 17th century London and the boy actors' performances of transgressive characters. But the schoolroom served a different cultural purpose than the theaters in London, and thus the performance of vice in the grammar school signified differently, given the pedagogical purpose of schoolboy musical theatrical entertainments. Several transgressive roles are found in late 16th or early 17th century. Several transgressive roles are found in a late 16th or early 17th century school play, Oedipus, and this is a page from that, the manuscript. The Elizabethan Club at Yale University holds a unique manuscript. You see it here, labeled Oedipus with a Song, which was copied and corrected in a single secretary hand. Features that suggest that it is an institutional file copy created to commemorate a special occasion in the life of the school. The final two leaves contain a speech delivered before the founders at the entrance of the school. And this laudatory oration refers to the Selby family, who were associated with Ducastle upon Tyne, Braxton, Twizzle, and Barrack. Schoolboy performance before dignitaries and important patrons was a common occurrence in early modern England, but the choice of play is puzzling. Why Oedipus? The grammar school dramatic repertory often included vernacular plays modeled on classical antecedents, but this version of Oedipus goes out of its way to be transgressive, for in addition to the famous murderous incestuous son, a new character is added, a rebellious scholar who vents his spleen and song. Strangely, the disobedient sons that schoolmasters frequently omitted from their adaptations of classical plays were not edited out in this case. The play also includes a male character singing a lullaby, a type of musical performance that pushed against prevailing gender norms. As with so many other works performed at school, this version of Oedipus was only partly custom made as it combined newly written material with Alexander Neville's translation of Seneca's Oedipus, Thomas Newton's translation of Seneca's Te Tabais, a lullaby attributed in a concordant source, probably erroneously, to William Byrd, and a song for a rebellious scholars set to a well-known ballad tune. The prologue in Act I of Oedipus, with the exception of the lullaby, is not drawn from other sources, and it is in these newly written sections that the adapter attempted to didactically frame the play. The prologue claims that the audience may find a looking glass for the sins of their own society, which in these days is well near overwhelmed. They might also learn of the fickleness of Dame Fortune and the just revenge and direful plagues that might result from horrible crimes such as damnable incest. Indeed, the prologue meticulously lists all of Oedipus's faults and the punishment of the gods that resulted. Thus, you shall see the end of sin is shame and misery. In some respects, we might think of the play as being analogous to the barring out of the schoolmaster, a ritual in which the students locked their schoolmaster out of the classroom, a ritual that allowed misrule within certain boundaries. Yet such tension-releasing rituals often did not work. Accounts of schoolboy rebellion against their headmasters are prevalent in the surviving historical re record. Perhaps Oedipus straddled a similar difficult line as it negotiated the boundary between licensed revelry and the enactment of vice, holding in tension a desire for moral education with the need to produce a lively, interesting play. 
However, the manuscript with its detailed stage directions and interpolated music points to a more unsettling and complex performative reality. Oedipus is no longer a tragic hero whose ambitions and very life were derailed by inexorable fate. This Oedipus is petulant in need of comeuppance, a counterexample of proper behavior. In Act 1, Scene 3, Oedipus enters, arguing with his companion Europhilus after a game of dice. Oedipus accuses Europhilus of cheating, swears profanely, God's wounds, and boasts of his lineage. Am I not a prince and heir apparent to the king? Europhilus chides young Oedipus. It is not the descent of birth, and boast thou what thou can, but the consent of conditions that makes a gentleman. Europhilus then informs Oedipus that he's neither the true son of the king, nor is he noble indeed. This argument between Oedipus and Europhilus did not simply transpire as words on a page. The scribe encouraged the reader to imagine the physicality of the performance. In the left margin of the manuscript, he carefully notated stage action, telling Oedipus to give him Europhilus, a box on the ear, and you can see this in the left margin on the slide, and he prompted the two actors to draw. These marginal notations occur throughout the manuscript, allowing the reader, even one as distant from the performance event as we are, to conjure the presence of schoolboy actors. At such a moment, did the roughhousing boys forget the overarching moral message as they tussled and indulged in feigned naughty behavior? The musicologist Carolyn Abate has recently theorized the drastic quality of performance, and although I have some reservations about her formulation, it is useful in this case for thinking through what these fighting schoolboys would have felt. A brief tangent from my early modern schoolboys is necessary to explain Abate's theory of the drastic. So in an influential article, Abate recounted her own experience accompanying a singer. She tried to ask interpretive questions as she played a Mozart aria, such as, where exactly is the Enlightenment subjectivity in these notes? She found it impossible to answer as she played. Instead, she found herself thinking, doing this really fast is fun, or here comes a big jump, observations that point toward the physical pleasures and challenges of performing music. Okay, sidebar ended. Similarly, these schoolboys, boxing ears, drawing swords, were probably not in the moment thinking about the didactic qualities of their performance. As I cannot interview the boys and the audience about their experiences, I must rely upon the drastic qualities of performance that we find, in this case, in the margins of the manuscript. The Oedipus manuscript also contains the residue of transgressive or rebellious musical performance. In one case, a boy sang against masculine type, and in the second, he performed a rebellious ballad. For the first song, a lullaby, the scribe included notation. In act one, scene one, Forbus, the king of Corinth's herdsmen, finds baby Oedipus bound to a tree. He sings to the child to quiet his crying. The scribe interpolated the music into the text and supplied detailed performance directions in the margin. The stage directions and musical notation outline how the acting and performance may have been realized, or at least it preserves how the scribe would like the entertainment to be remembered. At the bottom of five verso, the stage directions for the child actor playing Forbus indicate that around the time he said, would Meg my wife for all our strife could bring me such a boy, the baby began to cry. To soothe the infant, the actor sang the snippet of music given at the bottom of the page, B Baby B, the single line of music at the bottom of five verso. After singing this brief passage, the actor reverted to speech. Three things that peace displeased babes, as oft times I've heard, the pap to feed, the voice to still, the arm to move and guard, them from all ill. Two last I'll use, the first my wife shall do. The meantime, I will still the child before I come here too. Alas, alas, he cries amain, but I will sing him still again. The actor may have reprised B Baby B after his speech, or he could have gone on to the more formal lullaby given on six recto. But the stage directions and musical notation only tell part of the story. 
What of the sound of the boy's voice, the presence of his body? The range of the song is notated in the manuscript as suitable for a boy alto, although it certainly could have been transposed in performance. The high-pitched sound of an unbroken male voice would have revealed a disconnection between the body of the schoolboy performer and the paternal role he played. Boy actors sometimes wore prosthetic beards to better impersonate adult masculinity, but the boy actor's voice could not be similarly disguised. As Gina Bloom has shown, the boy's voice was a site of anxiety in early modern culture, for it was slippery, potentially unstable, and liminally gendered. Given the parallel position of boys and women within early modern culture, both were subordinate to men, it is perhaps not surprising that this boy actor sang a lullaby, a genre associated with women in early modern culture. We might imagine the vocal traces of the boy actor singing the dotted rhythms and rising and falling vocal line, which suggests the physical motion of rocking an infant. The melodic structure is simple and repetitive, landing with frequency on the final of the mode. The effect here would have been soothing, grounded, and reassuring, particularly if it were performed well. The boy played against masculine type, which might have registered as being transgressive, but in so doing, he demonstrated his rhetorical range and musical skill. More overt musical and dramatic unruliness occurs in scene six of the same act. This time, a boy enacted a disorderly version of himself, playing at disobedience. The clownish Tom Thriftless enters, flings his satchel of books away, and sings, Farewell, adieu, these books of mine, to the well-known Selinger's Round, a popular song and dance often associated with revelry in early modern drama. The first line of the text is given in Oedipus draws upon a version from John Pickering's A New Interlude of Feist containing the history of Herestes, performed at court in 1567 by Lord Rich's men. Once again, the author of Oedipus recomposed things to accommodate the new dramatic circumstances, transforming a celebration of martial virtue into a tune of schoolboy vice. And you can see the comparison on the slide here. Thriftless rejoices at the closing of his school due to plague. Unlike his schoolmates, he has no wealth or parents, so he relishes his freedom. Those familiar with Pickering's version might have heard a military echo in the background, the virtuous alternative to Thriftless's feckless and careless rejection of authority. What might audiences have made of a boy singing joyfully as he bids school adieu? Unlike the lullaby, there was not the same gender disconnect between dramatic role and voice. This was a boy singing as a boy, not a boy facing the impossible task of vocally impersonating a man. But embedded in the song is a potential for subversion realized through performance. What if the boy emphasized certain textual passages? For example, in the first verse, the words lustily and carelessly fall on the two highest notes, encouraging the singer to perform those words with special force. Alternatively, if the boy were going through puberty, he may have this may have been a moment where he felt a frisson of panic as he pushed against his physical limits. If his voice cracked, then the physical liminality of the boy's voice would have obscured the semantic meaning of the rebellious text. The character Tom Thriftless would have disappeared as the audience's attention was redirected to the fragility of adolescence. Hearing his youthful, imperfect voice, adult auditors might have even felt condescending sympathy toward the boy actor. As he was still a child, his transgressive behavior, real or feigned, might still be corrected by his elders. Obviously, the scribe of the Oedipus manuscript wrote it in such a way that encourages the reader, modern or early modern, to imagine a performance, but it is not in and of itself a performance. The marginal stage directions, the musical cues, even the interpolated music, these are all just the traces of a performance, a performance that perhaps only occurred in the idealizing imagination of the scribe who copied the play. What might a transcription of the actual performance of Oedipus look like? Oedipus enters wrongly, Thriftless's voice doth crack, or Sir Selby doth laugh at the boyish squeaking of Forbus as he rocked the babe. These are the elements that cannot be recaptured. 
Still, by restoring the drastic implications of performance, we might get a much clearer sense of the complexity and multivalence of schoolboy dramas such as Oedipus. As my book explores, the performance space of the schoolroom was haunted, haunted by the church, the court, the domicile, and societal expectations regarding gender, class, and morality. The schoolroom was also haunted by the public stage and the unsavory specter of the professional actor and, after 1660 in England, the professional actress. Case study number two is drawn from chapter six, which teases out the physical realities of the relationship between students and professionals in performance, as well as this fluid but discursively policed boundary between public and private, between occupational and recreational. Many of the performances I analyze in chapter six consider the blurred boundary between pedagogical activity and public show in girls' boarding schools. Although there were anxieties about female performance and concerns for the girls' chastity, these performances persisted. Most spectators must have willfully forgotten, put aside, or accepted the associations with the professional, suppressing the stories of dancing masters and musicians eloping with their students, the eroticism of the cross-dressed actresses of the public play, and the eroticism of the cross-dressed actresses of the public playhouses. As performance studies scholar Joseph Roach has noted, collective memory is selective, and selective memory requires public enactments of forgetting, either to blur the obvious discontinuities, misalliances, and ruptures, or more desperately, to exaggerate them in order to mystify a previous golden age now lapsed. This process of forgetting was at work when musical excerpts from The Libertine, a dramatic retelling of the Don Juan story by Thomas Shadwell, were repurposed for a ball, a term commonly used to refer to performance activities at girls' schools during this period. The manuscript, and you can see it here, is in the British Library. It's the additional manuscript 31405, and it dates from the early 18th century. It contains arrangements of two pieces that focus on pastoral and amorous pleasures, Henry Purcell's incidental music from the Libertine and Daniel Purcell's unrelated Shepherd's Tune Your Pipes. The manuscript also bears some marks of performance with notes about the soloists, um, for example, Mistress E colon M and C, and instructions such as symphony again and then the chorus, dance here and turn quick. Nothing is known about the provenance or copyist of the manuscript, so I cannot conclusively say that it was part of a school ball, but the term, the use of the term ball in the manuscript and the preponderance of female soloists invites such speculation. The two works together were possibly part of a school-based evening of pastoral entertainment, similar to other works performed by schoolgirls from the same period. Still, the taint of the libertine would have been hard to forget, for those who had seen the play. As Curtis Price remarked, Shadwell's Libertine, first performed on the public stage in 1675, might confirm one's worst suspicions about restoration art and morality. According to restoration era prompter John Downs, the play proved quite popular, enjoying several revivals during the period. Although in his diary, the scientist Robert Hooke called it, quote, an atheistical wicked play. Shadwell excused these excesses, claiming that vices were displayed only to show their depravity, and there was a dreadful punishment inflicted upon the eponymous libertine. The play describes and portrays the debauched pursuits of Don John in loving detail. Mozart and De Ponte's Don Giovanni is mild in comparison. Before the play even begins, the libertine has raped countless women and has committed some 30 murders, including those of his father and the governor of Seville. In the course of the play, he kills a romantic rival, the brother of a woman he wants to seduce, and a discarded mistress. He also callously jokes about becoming a widower as his fourth wife commits suicide in front of him. And in the last act of the play, he prompts his companions to burn a nunnery and accost a group of shepherds and nymphs. Purcell penned music for 1690's revival and the music excerpted in the ball manuscript belongs to act four. Shepherds and nymphs celebrate their happy loves, 
a happiness that will be disrupted by rape as Don John and his crew abduct the women with an eye to violent sexual conquest. The plot of the Libertine revels in violence, but this violence has been erased from the ball manuscript. There's no reference to the music's public stage origins. The musical activities of Purcell's Nymphs and Shepherds are just labeled a ball song. Thus, on the page, there is only pastoral singing and dancing, praise of innocent pleasure. Yet one cannot help but wonder where this was performed and what the audience knew. What if they'd previously heard Purcell's music within the context of Shadwell's play? Would they have recalled what came next, the rapes, the arson? Furthermore, the arrangement presented in the manuscript includes a bass singer. If the music in this manuscript were performed at school, what do we make of, of his presence? Was this perhaps a male professional, a teacher performing alongside his students? And indeed, in this chapter, there are many other examples of male teachers performing alongside, his, alongside female students, so it's possible. This manuscript for the ball is but one of several early 18th century copies of the Libertine's pastoral scene, and none of them are associated with its original theatrical context. In this expurgated form, it circulated independent of Shadwell's unsavory drama, or as Price observed, the soprano air Nymphs and Shepherds, the opening of the pastoral scene, has become in this century, and he's writing in the 20th century, a hackneyed emblem of schoolboy innocence, a particularly sweet irony considering its dramatic origins. In the Ball manuscript, we see something of the way in which Purcell's music was transformed, potentially through the schoolroom, into the emblem of innocence described by Price, although eroticism may have been restored via the dancing bodies of the girls or the male school teacher who took the baseline at the ball. As I noted in the introduction to this talk, Documents of performance such as this occlude as much as they reveal. As they circulate, they reformulate and reshape what is known of the past. Whether or not the Ball manuscript was performed in a pedagogical context, it was through sources such as this that nymphs and shepherds became dissociated from the libertine. This allowed amateur children and choir masters to perform it with impunity, even to great acclaim. The Manchester School Children's Choir sang an arrangement of the piece under the direction of Sir Hamilton Harty at the Free Trade Hall in Manchester with the Halle Orchestra in 1929, and more than a million copies were sold, reinforcing the association between nymphs and shepherds and innocent childhood. The Columbia Disc credits the piece thusly with no mention of the libertine. Recorded in the Free Hall Manchester, Nymphs and Shepherds, Manchester School Children's Choir with the Halle Orchestra, conducted by Sir Hamilton Harty. This recording is available on YouTube, and the comments section is full of reminiscences of people who sang it as children, discussing their nostalgic impressions of the music. It brings back wonderful memories of my school days, says one interlocutor. This recording was also archived online by the BBC and their website restores something obscured by the Ball Manuscript and the Columbia Disc, the song's dramatic context, forcing the viewer to contemplate the sound of children's voices in conjunction with Shadwell's smutty play via the title here, The Libertine. The BBC labeled it Nymphs and Shepherds, The Libertine. The BBC website, archived Nymphs and Shepherds because Dame Edna Everidge selected it for Radio 3's private passion show. With tongue firmly in cheek, Dame Edna, the female alter ego of comedian Barry Humphreys, claimed that she was exposed to the best and most highbrow music even in the womb. She remembered that one of the earliest songs she sang was at Sunday school, Purcell's Nymphs and Shepherds, although she claimed she did not know what Nymphs and Shepherds were, wink wink. As Roach has observed, even when forgetting is willful, past performances bleed through to the present. Their erasure is always incomplete. Through Dame Edna's satirical eye and the BBC's thoroughness of citation, the libertine has been restored. Other listeners, however, are utterly, even aggressively devoted to Notes and Shepherds as an emblem of childhood innocence. 
The song was used in precisely this way as the nostalgic sounds of childhood passed in 1989 when 146 of the children from the 1929 recording gathered at Manchester Town Hall to commemorate the event and sing Purcell's tune, now as elderly choristers in their 70s. The reporter described the moment when the recording was played. Every nymph and shepherd in the room was gazing into the long ago and very quietly singing along with his or her 1929 self. Subsequently, playwright Victoria Wood turned a fictionalized account of the story of the 1929 recording and the chorister reunion into a play with music, That Day We Sang, commissioned by the Manchester International Festival in 2011. The Nymphs and Shepherds recording was re-performed as part of Wood's play, this time with modern school children recruited from four North Manchester primary schools. Remembering the recording process in 1929, Stanley Rose, one of the original performers, described the children as a scruffy lot of elementary school brats, cajoled into confident performance by their teacher, Gertrude Rial, who told them they were braying like donkeys and were as soggy as yesterday's bread pudding. The 2011 school children, after much coaching by their choir master, Anna Flanagan, successfully managed to sing Purcell's piece, although they told the playwright they didn't like singing Nymphs and Shepherds. She told them it was show business. Get over it. Braying donkeys, children resisting Purcell's charms. Clearly, the documents of performance, modern recordings, early modern printed texts and manuscripts efface a great deal more than a play title. I hope this quick sampling of a few studies from my book has whetted your appetite for more. Although I'm a musicologist by training, I purposely wrote music, dance, and drama in early modern English schools with a broad readership in mind. I hope people from a variety of disciplines and backgrounds will find it useful for understanding how the performing arts inculcated girls and boys into gendered ways of being, how children's performance sometimes disrupted the script and score, and where we might locate the ghosts of pedagogical performances past in performances present. Thanks so much for listening. Well, thank you very much, Amanda. Um, we now have time for questions. So if you've got a question, please pop it in the chat. And while people are um, thinking of their questions and writing, I, I wanted to ask you about how you gathered all this material, because clearly there's an awful lot of archival work. Uh, you weren't just sitting in, you know, uh, the British Library to do all this. You must have gone to some really quite uh, exotic locale. So, so tell us a bit about the archival process. Yeah, it, it this book took me 10 years to write, and in part it was because of it required so much archival research. Um, I went to a lot of county records offices in the UK. I went to schools. Um, the people at Dulwich College were absolutely lovely. They fed me lunch, and <laughs> they were very kind and let me see their school archives. Um, I communicated a lot with the folks from Christ's Hospital as well. Um, and they were very kind to give me permission to use materials. So it involved a lot of travel. But one of I have one happy story and one sad story. So that the happy story was um, I'll do that one first. <laughs> I went to Preston uh, to the Lancashire County Records Office. Um, and I had a really hard time of it. I'd been to other county records offices and the, you know, the stuff I thought I was going to see there just didn't really bear fruit. And in Preston, I found this huge cache of material that was really crucial for um, uh, particularly thinking about how uh, religious music was used um, in schools. And all of these records back to the 17th century for this particular grammar school were intact. And so it was just as Trevor Trove. And also interpolated in these documents were like these really funny doodles that people had like <laughs> sketched funny faces and things. So it was a nice kind of break from some of the other things. One of the sadder things was is I had found evidence, or I thought I'd found evidence via another book that Oliver Cromwell's old uh, grammar school in Huntington, that they actually did uh, 
performance instruction in music and drama, which is kind of funny thinking about Oliver Cromwell having this instruction <laughs> given his opinions, especially about drama later on. Um, but that's what, I, did it. <laughs> what was that? Maybe that's what did it. <laughs> I don't know. He was tortured at school and didn't want more. But yeah, um, yeah so I, I went to uh, I uh, I went to this archive with high hopes, and uh, none of those records bore fruit. So I don't know what this other person saw that I did not see. And I asked the archivist, they're like, "This is all we have." <laughs> wow. So that was a disappointing tale. <laughs> So, so it sounds like it was a mixed bag, but you got, you know, enough for the book in the end. So that's really wonderful. Could you expand on your reservations about Abate's uh, drastic oh, yeah. Gnostic distinction? Do you find it to be a mismatch with the early modern culture? Thank you for that question. Great question. Oh, thanks so much. And nice to see that you're here. <laughs> um, my main issue is this, is that I think that her divide between the Gnostic and the drastic is too severe. So I actually, I do think that um, if you perform, you don't totally turn your brain off. It's not all about like whatever embodied thing that you're doing at the time. Um, I, I don't think the dividing line is quite as um, stark. Um, I do think that it is possible to think about performance hermeneutically, um, even as you're doing it to a certain extent. And I just speak from my own personal experience. Oftentimes, before I would perform something, I'd think quite deeply about it. And especially if, so I, I do think that to a certain extent, as I suggested with my reading of Oedipus, that if you're doing a stage-based fight or you're doing something like that, yeah, it's like doing choreography. You are thinking about what your next move is. But I think in some other cases, um, like if you're singing a song or doing something like that, that I do think that it is um, possible to be thinking interpretively, if you will, at the same time as you're doing it. So I don't think that there's necessarily that divide. Um, and I, I, it's just, it's it's not so much that I don't find her theory useful because I use it a lot in the book, um, but rather that I think that these categories of drastic and Gnostic are, it's, it's too hard of a binary, I think, between those two things. Okay, we've got another question from uh, uh, Candace Bailey, who asks, have you been able to trace the lives of any of these children past their school school days? Yeah, um, in one of the chapters, I actually uh, did manage to track down information about the students, and it has to do with this uh, school-based entertainment that was done at a grammar school, Apollo Shroving, um, and, uh, you know, and so I did trace like who these people were, kind of what class they were from. Um, mostly it was people who could afford to go to the school, even though it was a grammar school. So some of the children could have gone for free potentially. Um, but there were people who then were kind of in this pipeline and many of them ended up, if memory serves, ending up at Cambridge. But one of the key people who played um, this musical role of the siren character, Wentworth Randall, he was a total blank. I could not find anything about him. Um, so the person who kind of had this really prominent role in this entertainment and was apparently a wonderful singer because they gave this kid a lot to do, completely gone from the historical record. Um, while a lot of his classmates, I was able to dig up things. So that's an that just goes to show that there's sometimes these disparities in the historical record. You know, Wentworth Randall may have gone on to do great things, but it's just been lost. But I did manage to dig up some things. And there's other examples. For example, there was this mass that was done with schoolgirls, um, Cupid's Spanishment, which has been written a, a lot about in the literature. And uh, there's been a lot of work done about who the people were, the girls were who performed in that. Um, and also we know some of the other people, like the teachers who are participating too, we have information about that as well. Um, we have another question from uh, Caroline Virgin, who wants to know um, if there are details in the documents about how children were taught acting methods. <clears throat> Yeah, I talk about this a little bit in my intro introduction. Um, in the documents that I found, there's not so much 
information per se about exactly the strategies that they were used uh, that were used in the classroom for teaching acting. Sometimes, um, you know, we just have these documents that suggest that they were putting on this play and that that was part of the way that they were teaching them um, with this larger aim towards learning rhetoric and oration or being a good orator, which especially for the boys they could use later on in society in, in their role in society. I always find it kind of interesting, you know, the amount of stuff I found about the girls too, because they didn't need to use, right, the, you know, rhetoric and oratory in their future lives. And yet, um, in some of these works, they are allowed to speak even when they weren't allowed to speak on the public stage. And that's the case in something like Cupid's Banishment or um, Cupid is Coronation, uh, you know, where they're performing in the 1650s at a time when everything on the public stages were shut down. OK, uh, we've got another question from Scott Trudel. He says, thanks for a wonderful interview. I wonder if you might reflect on what your project contributes to our understanding of the history of music education within schools in relation to tutoring or private commercial music education. We often think about the late 16th century widening of musical educa educational education and attainment as witness in Thomas Morley's Pain and Ease introduction, mm. the figure of um, the figure often subversive of the music uh, tutor. Um, could you talk about what you uncovered in terms of the rationale or defense or changing climate concerning how music education was incorporated within educational institutions? Thanks for that, Scott. Yeah, that's a great question, Scott. Um, I do talk about music education in chapter one of the study and um, and what was at stake for music education. And it was different things for girls and boys to a certain extent, um, especially for girls. It was absolutely central, um, especially in the boarding schools, because it was a signifier of accomplishment. And it was thought that if you were able to get this training and, you know, I found evidence of, you know, these boarding schools from quite early in the 17th century that girls were going off to them um, in letters and correspondence talking about, oh, I'm sending my girl to school or whatever. And, you know, they did sometimes have to pay extra for music. Sometimes music was an add-on both at the grammar school for boys and um, for girls that they would pay extra for tuition in um, music. And they pay extra sometimes for tuition and dance and other things. So it was kind of like an a la carte sort of thing. Um, and sometimes the music master would come into the school periodically. They weren't kind of on the regular staff, especially that's the case in some of the records I found for the grammar schools that you just would have um, you know, a visiting music professor that they weren't necessarily that they weren't necessarily on the regular staff that they were played, um, and we know this from the payment records that I dug up. Um, so I think that in terms of music, it did fall along gendered lines. For boys, it was a sign that they could potentially signify as a gentleman in society if they had a certain level of musical accomplishment. Um, and you know, displayed via sometimes these musical entertainments that were performed at grammar schools. In terms of girls, it was absolutely central to the curriculum. For the boys, it was not as central to the curriculum, the musical training and the dance training, but for girls, it was absolutely central a lot of times to these curricula at the boarding schools because it was viewed as a way of making them appealing on the marriage market. And I've also found evidence that they used these performances at the boarding schools with the girls um, as a way of allowing potential suitors to come in and check these girls out and decide if they might be marriageable. Um, there's some evidence of that as well. Well, just following on for that, um, Burak Ermak has asked, are there any restrictions on girls at school um, at school, school performances during the Restoration Era? Any restrictions? Mm -hmm. um, there were a lot of anxieties about it, and we can see that in dramas of the time, including the drama, the, the play that was written by Thomas Durfee, um, uh, Love for Money, or the boarding school. And Durfee had actually worked at Josiah's Priest Boarding School in Chelsea. He, as you know, he he wrote an epilogue <laughs> for for the boarding school performance at Chelsea, um, and so and he 
it seems to have been there for a summer kind of hanging out. And he even admits in his play that that was the case. But in this play, you have, it's kind of a satire of musical entertainment to the boarding school. So you have these music masters and dancing masters who are wanting to elope with their students and are getting up to no good. And the students are vapid and, you know, and, and, you know, clearly there's people who come in and watch them perform from the outside. And so there was some of this anxiety about outsiders coming in. And you can actually see that in the prologues and epilogues of some of the entertainments themselves, like Beauty's Triumph or the Dido and Aeneas um, epilogue as well. You have these anxieties about, oh, well, we're really just these cloister nuns in our boarding school. And, you know, we don't want you to look at us, but we do want you to look at us. It's kind of they're 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 kind of playing this very fine line. Um, in, in what they're up to. So there, it's not as if these performances in the post-restoration era at the boarding schools were without kind of anxiety. They definitely had some, people were anxious about it. Well, we've just got a couple of minutes left. So um, uh, you mentioned uh, Dido and Aeneas. So, and you, you said at the beginning, you weren't going to talk about the famous examples, but how do, uh, you know, how, how does Dido and how do, does um, Venus and Adonis fit in with the picture that you've been painting for us? Yeah, um, both of these were uh, these operas that were um, performed or these kind of miniature operas that were performed at Josiah's Priest Boarding School. Um, and as many folks know, if you're a late 17th century specialist in work on music, um, there's a lot about this, especially Dido, we don't know. We don't know if it was originally created for the boarding school. Brian White has turned up this letter saying it was made, it was a ball made. Um, for the school, um, but it's 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 kind of hard to, to we we don't know if it originated there. What I did find is that um, thinking through both Venus and Adonis and Dido and Aeneas within a broader perspective of pedagogical entertainments, I think yielded interpretive fruit. Um, that these were not necessarily these one-off things, that it was part of a much larger practice. And furthermore, I think that, you know, thinking through the implications in previous entertainments, school-based entertainments, um, we definitely see male dancing masters, male singing masters taking roles in performances alongside their students. Now, we don't have a cast list for Dido and Aeneas, and other people have suggested that maybe it is possible that Aeneas was played by a girl. Um, certainly in Venus and Adonis, we know that Adonis was played by a girl um, because we do have the cast list for that. But we don't know the cast list in terms of Dido and Aeneas. Um, and, uh, but it's possible that a voice teacher took the role. Um, James Hart, he taught voice at the school and it's possible it falls within his range. It's possible he played the role or it's possible that they followed the same practice as Venus and Adonis. Um, but what we do know, and I think it's, it is interesting to think through the implications of, is this mixture of professional um, and uh, student performers and kind of what thinking about that might do for us interpretively um, in looking at these canonical works. Great, well, thank you for that. We've got one minute left and we have just one last question from uh, Luis Manrique. If we've missed other questions, I'm sorry about that, but we've done our best. Um, he wants to know really quickly, what was your main challenge in writing the book? <laughs> oh, well. Just, one. just pick one. Just pick one. Um, one challenge was just the level of archival research and digging. Um, and then after I found a corpus of material, figuring out what I what story I was going to tell with it. That was the biggest challenge. What what was the story? Because all of us, when we create a book, we have to create a compelling narrative that organizes the historical evidence that we find or, you know, and to organize, as I say, my documents of performance, I had to figure out a story to tell. And so that took me a while to figure out what was the story I was going to tell about these documents, because 
nobody wants to read an archival data dump. I might think it's totally fascinating, all these far-flung archives I went to and all this digging, but you have to tell a story about and think carefully about what these documents are telling you. And so that took me a while to process. Well, um, you did a magnific magnificent job of it. <laughs>